morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finneran, pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Today is Tuesday, November the 23rd, and we gather this next hour around the gift of the inspired and true Word of God and put on our Christ goggles as we continue our study of the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, which is chapter one. We had a great start yesterday with Dr. Christopher Mitchell, who is the who wrote the commentary, Concordia Commentary on Song of Songs, and it is a huge book. And so we try to muddle through that as we prepare for today. But also, it's a, it's a book that we often don't dig into. And you might have a lot of misperceptions of what it is about, but ultimately, it's a love poem showing us God's God's love for the church in Christ. And that, what better thing to study? And the more I read this and the more I dig in, the more it reveals how we put on our Christ goggles and the depth of God's love for you. That's why we're here, for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported by our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation. For more information of their great work around the world, visit lhfmissions.org, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's word, we welcome regular guest, Pastor John Lekomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics here on KFUO. Pastor Lekomsky, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Yeah, good to be talking to you, Brady. Uh, we're, we're now back down in the St. Louis area, a little further away from you and your cold. <laughs> so <laughs> Today is supposed to be 50, so there it is. Yeah, well, that's what we have, today. too. So apparently you guys are doing real well up there. That's good. Oh, man. I tell you what, I went to pick up my daughter from Concordia, Missouri last week. And uh, and we get there and it was 55. I mean, it's 50. I can't remember. <laughs> but I was standing outside of the sweatshirt out and my daughter was also with the sweatshirt on. And all of her friends were like, man, it is cold out here today. So I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a new world here. I'm in a new world. Yeah. So, it, it is all relative. It is all relative. <laughs> it, it really is. Hey, before right. we begin, though, do we do? We, do you need to give a disclaimer here? Because you know, uh, amongst uh, uh, the Jewish people, you, you weren't supposed to be reading uh, the book of uh, the Song of Solomon until you had had come of age. So, oh. do we need to tell parents they need to take their kids in the other room? Or I guess everyone's in school, so maybe we don't need to worry about that. Well, but, and I would uh, encourage people because there are a few passages throughout this whole book a reminder that there are some very um i want to say direct quotes that that solomon has and so forth i wouldn't say anything that's like outlandishly crazy but it is something that to take caution and to think about as it becomes very much so a more mature audience um well, compared to what we watch on TV and in the daytime TV, yeah, I don't know if it's that right. much worse or not, but, but <laughs> no, definitely no. something to keep in mind. Definitely keep in there, mind. Was, there was a time when this might have been offensive, but I, I doubt. <laughs> You're right. Probably not anymore. <laughs> and it's a wonderful reality of, of uh, to look at Scripture being very a realist, you know, being very real of a very um, glorifying thing, which is marriage, which is how a husband sees his wife and how a wife sees her husband. And for us to be able to talk about that in a beautiful way. And I think, I know the song of songs definitely captures that. So I think that's a good enough, um, I call it precursor warning, if you will, for our yes, listeners. Yes, there what you go. Thoughts? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That'll do the job. So, yeah. So anything else going on for you or what's going on in wrestling with the basics? Uh, uh, no, not, not much else going on. We just keep plugging along every Saturday morning at nine o'clock, whatever seems to be good to Matt or myself. And of course, Thanksgiving coming up this Thursday and Christmas just around the corner, which means you, my dear beloved brother, have a lot of work to do. I, I will keep you in my prayers. <laughs> Please yeah. do. And that's, and that's a good reminder. Pray for your pastors and other church workers because it does get busy. I was noticing that this week. I was like, okay, so I have a sermon, 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 <laughs> sermon um, coming up. So keep your pastors in your prayers and encourage them the best you can because we're all a little stressed. And it's, I know in Minnesota, you know, COVID numbers have kind of gone up a little bit, and, and so the questions just started arising, and we're all nervous, and so I'll keep that in your prayers as well. On that note, Pastor, as we put on our Christ goggles, can you begin our time asking the Lord's blessings on our time in Scripture? 
Oh, Lord, please give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. We, we always need the Holy Spirit, whatever passage we would be reading. But, but in uh, books like the Song of uh, Solomon, we, we especially need your aid because they do seem rather, rather strange to us. And yet may we uh, come out of this study being strengthened in our faith that we are your uh, beloved spouse and you love us enough you would actually give up your life for us. And there is no greater love than that that a husband might have for his wife. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. For the strengthening of our faith. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions for us concerning our text, and this goes through the whole book of Song of Songs, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, or call 314 821 0850. 314 821 0850. Now, pastors, I was, I was reading this. It, it made me think that this is a true story of he said, she said, um, <laughs> as we look at chapter one. So, how do you want to start us off in the first chapter of Song of Songs? Well, let me just make a, a couple of opening comments if I can. First of all, yeah, I, I really another shout out to Christopher Mitchell. That it is the most comprehensive commentary on the Song of Songs that I have ever seen. If if anyone's interested in really going into this depth, you can get it from Concordia Publishing House. It's part of the Concordia Commentary series. Uh, but frankly, it overwhelmed me because <laughs> right. I only had about an hour to get ready for this. So what I'm going to be channeling today is Luther's commentary, uh, which you can also get through Concordia Publishing House. It's in in uh, Luther's works. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll try to find the volume number and give that to people before we're done. Uh, but volume 15, volume 15. So ask for it by name, Luther's Works, volume 15. And he's a little more succinct and to the point. So I'm going to be channeling some of his insights. Uh, although it's interesting, uh, Brady, because, you know, we just got through with Ecclesiastes, and, and Luther has a commentary on Ecclesiastes. And for some reason, Luther wants to see these things as addressing issues of the state, and, and I guess it's because uh, uh, Solomon is king, and, and Luther has this kind of picture that Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon was something that uh, Solomon might have read to all of his fellow princes and rulers and governors and what have you, because he, he takes it as a uh, actually a, a poem about the relationship of God with the state. But mm. what I would like to do is see it as more of a poem about the relationship of God with us. I, I would like to make it a little more personal. And I think all the comments Luther makes about God and the state would certainly also apply to us as individual Christians. Uh, the one thing, though, real quickly that Luther says that I, I think is, is cool, uh, there's a lot of different ways of interpreting this book, okay? Um, in fact, there are ways of interpreting this book where you don't even get Jesus involved at all. Right. Um, but, but Luther quotes Paul in 2 Timothy, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So whatever interpretation a person does of the Song of Songs, it needs to fulfill that requirement, that it's something that's going to be helping us in righteousness. And again, remembering that Righteousness is a very big term for Paul because the righteous shall live by faith. So right. whatever you do when you read the, 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 the uh, Song of Songs or uh, Song of Solomon, it has to strengthen your faith in some way. And I really think some of Luther's insights are going to help do that for you and for me and all of our listeners. And that's something where, it, it, well, let's just go to verse 1 and we'll talk about verse yeah, 1. Yeah. I think you set it up beautifully in verse 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Um, well, yeah, a lot of S's as we'll go through the scripture today, but <laughs> Song of Songs, and this is something interesting to me, is that Solomon was a, a writer of songs. Uh, it tells us in yeah. First Kings 4 that he wrote over a thousand songs throughout his time. So he was a man of music, loved music, and for this, it was a, a love poem to be sung. I thought that was a significant reality. Anything else from that first verse? Uh, well, just I, I suppose we should point out that some scholars would suggest that when it says which is Solomon's, they would interpret that as written for Solomon, not written by Solomon. But mm -hmm. but I don't know everybody I've ever read or or, or heard. It, yeah, this is what Solomon wrote. But just so people realize that technically it could be something that was written for him rather than by him. But I don't see any reason why we wouldn't uh, believe right. that he is the author here. And so uh, it, it sets it up right away that this is to be done to music and to understand that Solomon's part of it. So we understand that it'd probably be part of a, you know, a wisdom, a wisdom theology, if you will. I don't think it's wisdom literature per se, but it definitely is in that same light. Any thoughts on um, how we would 
quantify or how so would we identify are, are we, this? Are we singing it? Are we singing it today? <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I'm doing the Psalms too, and there was Pastor Chris yeah. Mathis last week, and I kept bringing it up. I was like, well, this is to be sung. So finally, he started singing it. He started chanting. I was like, yes, I got it. So maybe that's my goal today is that <laughs> there we get we Pastor John Lekomsky starting to sing. So anyways. Well, I, I told you, you really need to do Thy Strong Word, the musical. <laughs> that, we, we talk about doing that for wrestling with basics we haven't got it done yet but but think uh, about that the, the, I will I strong pray. the musical I, w- yes. I will pray about this yeah so okay. is this is this wisdom literature or would you define it as something else oh i don't even let's read it <laughs> who, I, I, who no, cares what we're going to define it what's what's right. it trying to say yeah, well, you yeah. Read it's a love poem there. that's what it no. is yeah there we go we'll yeah. start with there okay so we'll start with the bride who confesses her love verses two through four Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. So as I mentioned right away, it's she um, is speaking. And so what, what are your thoughts? What is she saying here? Well, okay, you know, I'm a word guy, and, and so I like mm-hmm. to check out the words and what they mean and all of that. Uh, and, and the first thing that's striking is this word love, very, very predominant in the Song of Songs. And, and what's strange is it's you, you don't find it hardly anywhere else. Uh, it's almost like a word that Solomon has taken up just to use in this poetry. In fact, what's really crazy <laughs> is previous to this, the only use of this word is when you're referring to your uncle or your aunt. So I have no idea <laughs> how the word that is used for uncle and aunt now all of a sudden becomes this word uh, of the, the relationship of, of a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, I should say, because that's the thing. These people are in relation but yeah, that's that's strange that we have this word that, uh, although Isaiah, Isaiah does use the same word once when he says, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very high hill, which I think points out to us that this is more than just a romantic relationship between a husband and a wife, that this word here is certainly implying a greater relationship, and indeed throughout the Scripture, right? The Bible often portrays uh, Israel and Jerusalem and, and the Jews as being the bride of, of uh, 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 God. Uh, in fact, Ezekiel uh, has that same uh, context where he says, When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And against the same word that Solomon's using here, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. And of course, you know who Ezekiel's speaking about. He's speaking about the people of Israel. Uh, which, by the way, if I could just throw in a, a kind of an interesting sidelight, especially with Christmas coming up, you, you know how Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes? You know that? You know that verse, right? Of course. Yeah. You know, the, o- the only other place where that is used is in this Ezekiel chapter 16, where he's talking about Israel. And, and, and that's what he said he did for Israel. He found Israel, this baby that had been abandoned, naked, left. And he says, I swaddled you. So I just think that's so cool that that, that mm-hmm. Old Testament references is there. Think about that when you hear about Jesus being swaddled. Swaddled means to be someone to take you in all of your nakedness and your the, the, your danger and your fear and to just wrap you up tight so you don't need to worry about anything. Um, mm. that, the other thing that's crazy here is the word for kiss, <laughs> okay? okay? The word for yep. kiss. Now, now, that is used. That is used in other places. People are kissing all the time. But it's also interesting that it also has a theological connotation. Uh, re- remember when, when, who is it? Is it, uh, oh, is it Elijah? I think it's Elijah who's just bemoaning and he's thinking, oh man, everyone's abandoned the Lord. And, and, and what does the Lord say to him? He says, well, not so, not so. <laughs> he says, uh, uh, um, Oh, where's that verse? Uh, I've left 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. See? So just to point out, the words for love and the kiss here are used elsewhere in Scripture to indicate more than just a romantic thing, but it does indicate a relationship between people and, and, and the God they believe and trust in. Could be bad. You could be kissing Baal, but no, no, you need to be kissed by God. That's, that's the point. 
And you also have in Romans 16, you know, greet each other with a holy kiss. Is that that Christian connection? Clearly, that's different than what we're talking about here. There is that romantic piece to this um, with the woman who who uh, Dr. Mitchell said yesterday is we don't really know who she is. He has a few theories. Of course, he's done a lot of research on this. Um, but really, it's just the Shulamite, the Shulamite woman who says that. Yeah, kiss me. The, uh, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. So it, it is a. It is an important piece of Holy Scripture, but this one clearly is more of a romantic um, loving. But th- like you said, this whole thing is not like this erotic um, type of message. It definitely is showing the oneness that they have in their relationship with the Lord and along with the Lord. So it, it, it is an interesting dynamic there. Anything else? And and so you got Psalm 212, which also says, kiss the son, lest he be mm-hmm. angry and you perish in the way. Yeah, so, so, right. so, so you're right. So so the idea is these these words here for love and these words for kiss. And I think it is interesting that, that Paul, uh, Solomon picks out this word for love that you don't find other places in the Bible, because I think he's trying to say to us, there's something bigger than just this thing between the Shulamite and the man, probably Solomon. No, because this is, as you said, this is a picture of the relation. And this is what, as Christians, we want, don't we? We, we, we want the God to come down and show his love for us. And, and the love he has for us is better than wine. And, and, and here Luther points out that, that wine gladdens the heart of men, right? That's what it says in the mm-hmm. Psalms. Wine is the thing that brings you happiness. Well, guess what? That the word of God, that's better than anything you'll find here on earth that would bring you happiness. And we want that. We want his anointed oils. We want his name, you know. And, and of course, uh, the, 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 the term name means the knowledge of, the understanding of. So, so we want to know this, this God. We want it poured out on us. And Luther has an interesting take on this. Therefore, virgins love you because he says this is the godly people. And that's probably a point, isn't it? Uh, usually we mm-hmm. think of virginity as being kind of a—well, uh, Mary is a virgin, right? That's a big thing. It's a, it's a holiness. It's a purity. Uh, now, we don't want to run too far down that because certainly sexual relationships is also a thing of holiness and purity. We don't want to say that it's better for you to remain a virgin. But I do think often, uh, uh, figuratively, we think of virginity as a purity. And so that's it. Yeah, the people that are godly, they do love mm-hmm. the Lord. And, 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 and we want him to draw us to him, don't we? Uh, and, and not walk, not hesitant, not dragging our feet. No, we want to run into the chambers uh, of our king and our Lord. So I thought that was a pretty neat description of Luther for how it is for us as Christians. We really do want to be with the Lord. Uh, so, all right, that, that's all I got on those verses. And this is where uh, there's definitely hymnody that, that connects us oh, to this. Yeah. Uh, when you have your name is poured oil is oil poured out there for virgins love you how sweet the name of Jesus sounds is is definitely um, it definitely is uh, connected to this the understanding of the name of Jesus is is a connection that they have a Solomon being you know being a type of Christ if you will and definitely that relationship of saying how sweet the name of Jesus sounds and that to me that opened up the floodgates of like wow this does connect to Jesus this this longing this uh, joy of the marriage of, of the Shulamite and and Solomon and also for us is that realization that it is Christ who has died for the church and we long and wait for that time that we are united in the marriage feast that that hymn I mean it opened up that hymn to me in a beautiful way that I never thought about um, before so that was that was definitely something that I found um, did you anything on songs or hymns or anything like that that you found no, 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 but I did, you, you know, you had texted me that, and I appreciate that, and it's so neat to see that, that the richness of these hymns we sing are coming straight from the Word of God, you know, that these people who wrote them, they were smart people, and they knew their Bible. That's the key thing. They're constantly trying to bring in those references, and I'd never thought of that, but you're right, and it's a beautiful connection. Um, I'll sweep the, I, I, okay, let me do this, let me do this go quick. Ahead. I'll sweep yeah, the name yeah, of please, Jesus' please. sounds. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our fear. And I can't, Ah. I mean, that's totally how it sounds like she's speaking right now, is that Solomon, her husband, and it's such a beautiful language to hear from a feminine perspective of the marriage to say, your name is so beautiful, and da-da-da-da. And then obviously the Holy Spirit worked with this to point us to Christ. It's just a wonderful way for us to think. What what were you going to say? Well, just two other things. First of all, if we have any preachers listening to us, you you better pay attention to this because that's the Jesus you better be presenting to your people. 
<laughs> if we're not presenting a Jesus that That's draws true. us to him, that, that we want to go to him, then we're failing in our preaching, okay? That's what the Jesus we got to give people, the Jesus that the people, so they want to run to him. Uh, and then I remembered another commentary that Luther made about this phrase, draw me after you. And he points out that's a prayer, isn't it? We're going to Jesus and say, Jesus, you, you draw me to you because it's hard. Faith is hard, especially when you got all kinds of difficulties. And so in our difficulties, we say, Lord, you have to draw us to you. Make us run to you, O Lord, because it's really hard. Can I share with you a quote from Luther that I thought was kind of cool? Please. I love it. He says, he says, no manner of life is without its special burden. Marry a wife. Immediately you will discover a flood of ills. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to talk to Katie about that. You you will find yeah. things which displease you in your wife and in your children, and the care of the stomach will occupy you. Similarly, those who are in government experience a host of evils, for Satan is nowhere inactive. Prayer, then, is all that remains. By prayer, let us overcome the various hazards and rocks on which we run aground. For God allows us to be tested by such ills so that the glory of the word may be demonstrated and the divine power magnified in our weakness. Otherwise, there would be no way to demonstrate his glory and mercy. So that's Luther uh, commenting on why we say, draw me after you, because it's hard to have faith. And all we can do is say, Lord, well, then do what we can't do. Draw us to you and bring us this joy that we're going to talk about throughout this chapter. One that really draws me to this, what was really struck me, the Song of Solomon, is the perspective from um, the wife. And that's something that obviously you and I are not going to be able to have a good perspective on because no. we're not wives, you know, we're husbands and we know <laughs> how we can describe our, our brides. Um, but one thing that really struck me was this obvious, strong desire for her husband in a, in a biblical way. And I remember when I was in my first congregation, one of my members was a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, she would teach uh, uh, home ec and those other classes. I don't know what kind of teacher that is. Uh, sewing. She would do all those classes at her school. So she yeah. invited me to come speak about relationships a little bit, which looking back on, I was like, I didn't really know much at that time. Maybe, maybe I still don't. <laughs> but, but at that time, so I go there and one of the young ladies there talked about, she's like, you know, I don't get it. My mom will always talk about how excited she gets when dad comes home from work. And she's like, she's so excited. She loves it. And I remember hearing that and going, boy, I don't hear much of that. You know, people don't talk that way. Like, oh, I can't wait for my husband to come home and we can spend time together. We just don't talk that way. And that was kind of is very much so an eye opener that I encourage you, our listeners, to hear that from both ends. The, 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 the reality of the deep love that they have for one another and also the communal aspect of it, because it's he said, she said, and also others. So there's celebration all around, which is something that maybe we need to do. I need to celebrate my wife. Um, wives need to celebrate their husbands. And we should surround each other. And how can that not be a picture of the church as well, as the Lord loves us and we celebrate together this wonderful relationship our Lord has given to us in Christ. So that's something that I encourage our listeners to really think about as we continue to study Song of Solomon. Any other and, thoughts and, on those verses? And, 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 and so Luther says, you, husbands should love their wives such that the wife is sad to see them leave in the morning and uh -huh. rejoicing and happy to see them come home at night. Uh, so you're right. We can't speak about what it is to be a wife, but it is, of course, a very powerful expectation of what it is to be a husband and that we would love as Christ loved the church, as Paul says in Ephesians. Uh, and, and the other thing that Luther says that I thought was really cool, you will notice it is the king who brings the wife into the chambers. It's Jesus who brings us to him. Uh, we cannot do that. We, we do love him. We do love him. But we need to understand that in the doubts and the tribulations and struggles of this world, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we wonder about his love. Uh, that is the way we are in our sinful nature. But the great promise of this, this scripture here is that he's going to draw us into the chambers. So do not fear your doubts. Repent of them, confess them, but trust that he will bring you into the chambers. And therefore we have the end of that verse. We will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine again, more than the finest thing you could ever find here on earth. Rightly do they love you. But, but I think it's so cool that Solomon reminds us that comes comes from the king and what the king does for us. That's not something you can do on your own, but it is the fruit of what the king has done for us. 
So we look at this, and once again, it's a song. Another song that was highlighted was Draw Us to Thee, 701 in the Lutheran uh, service book. Draw us to thee, O grant that we may walk the road to heaven. Direct our way, lest we should stray, and from thy paths be driven. And so it's a wonderful, uh, that, that's, that's a wonderful hymn too, as you mentioned, draw me after you. So definitely that understanding of the Lord draws us, you know, to himself. And that's what we pray. Lord, keep us with you. Keep us on that right path. And then when it says, let us run, how can we not but think of Peter and John as they ran to the yeah. tomb, finding out that he was risen? I, that was a very, uh, a very clear picture, as you mentioned that today, that how could this not also be connected to the resurrection? I don't know because that's totally what I what I what I'm seeing as we as we profess Christ here in Song of Solomon. Um, yeah. Any other you, thoughts? You you really should have done a musical version. You should have got the hymns. You should have sung those. <laughs> well, for next time. <laughs> oh, I like speaking them. I don't. I guess I don't know. Is there any copyright laws of me singing on here? I don't know. I'm gonna make I, that I up know. right now. I can't sing. There's copyright laws. It doesn't work. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so I did like how you got number verse four. The king has brought me into his chambers. Clearly, this is a distinction of let us run. He's speaking about, she's speaking about the other women. They're celebrating yeah. this marriage, all of that. But obviously the relationship is between her and the king. Um, but also it connects us to us and Christ. So t can you expand on that a little bit? Because you mentioned that he invites us into his chambers. What does that mean for us as Christians? Well, I tell you what, could we save that until the end? Because sure. we actually okay, we have a description. Sure. We have the description of the chambers at the end. And so maybe it oh, would be better point. to, to, to we'll say that. that. Yeah. 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 Good call. So let's get to the others. The others um, in verse four. We'll read that and say a few thoughts and then we'll go to our break. We will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your name more than wine. Rightly do they love you. Pastor, we're about a minute left before our break. What are your thoughts as the others start speaking in, in this chapter? Well, and, and I, I think the, the, the point here is that if you were thinking that this was just about uh, a husband and a wife, just a, a love song that uh, had been written, uh, I, I think the others and, and the, the, the plural now, we will exalt and rejoice you. We will extol your love. I, I think that's Solomon clearly saying, I'm not talking just about me and my Shulamite wife. No, no I'm talking about all of us and our relationship to God. Uh, uh, both those that are within the church and those who will be also running to him uh, as the church continues to spread its fragrance. See, that's the other thing Luther points out. That's how the church is. The church has a fragrance that it sends out into all the world. And people say, hey, that smells good. And after break, we'll talk about why it smells good, because there's something significant mm -hmm. in the fact we have all this imagery of, of uh, uh, the, the use of the sense of our smell rather than the use of a sense of our sight. It doesn't say it looks good, but it does smell good. Well, anyway, so that would I, I, that's the only thing I would see in there, that it is a reminder. This is talking about more than just one man and one woman. It's talking about all of us and, and our relationship to Jesus. Well, right now, I want to talk more about that because if you read this whole book, it is so much fragrance. And what does that mean for them and for us? And we'll get on that on the other side of their break. We are studying Song of Songs, Chapter 1 with Pastor John Lekomsky, and we'll be right back. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. KFUO is a listener-supported radio ministry that needs your support to continue. When you partner with KFUO, you are proclaiming Christ worldwide. November 30th is Giving Tuesday, a day that encourages you to give back in whatever ways you can. Giving Tuesday presents a perfect time each year for you to support your favorite nonprofit organizations, including KFUO Radio. To give to KFUO, call 314-996-1518 or text K. 
KFUO to the number 41444 or give online at kfuo.org. Welcome back. We are studying Song of Songs, Chapter 1. We've gone through the first four verses with Pastor John Lekumski. And, and Pastor, it is something you brought up right before. Verse 3, your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. And so and, and talks about wine, too. It talks about there in verse, three, or verse 2 and also in verse 4. And throughout the book, as we dig through this, just so much, you start, you start thinking about the smells and the bells and the whistles, if you will. And it's very prominent. So you, you brought up a little bit before our break. What's happening here? What is, what all is this smells? I mean, is this essential oil selling us or what's going on? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now let's do a commercial for essential oils. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, take a break. <laughs> uh, well, and, and the whole thing comes up at the end again, uh, where my beloved is to me, a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. Uh, my mm. beloved is a cluster of henna blossoms. Uh Oh, uh, well, so this whole fragrance idea. And, and Luther has a really neat take on this whole idea of fragrance, because Luther says, see, that that's the word of God. And that's how you get to know the love of God is by the fragrance, by the smell, because you don't get to know it by the sight. And I thought that's a cool insight, because uh, what we look around us, man, Brady, I can tell you, there, I, there's a heap of troubles in my family right now and in the people around me. I, I got a neighbor right now whose little son has got leukemia. You're not supposed to get mm -hmm. leukemia when you're a young kid. That's something for old people to get. And uh, I don't want to belabor all this. But so you look and, and, wow, I don't know. Does God love me? Am I his beloved? It, it sure doesn't. But but that's, that's no, it's the fragrance you got to remember. That's the thing that will draw us to him. That's the thing that will strengthen our faith, that, that word of God, the promises he makes. Okay, all right. No, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I, there's evil in the world. This is a sinful world. You know, we ain't in mm -hmm. heaven. So don't mm -hmm. draw any conclusions from the trials you see around you, but just keep taking in that, that odor, that fragrance, uh, that word of God. And then you'll know, no, no, we are, we are his beloved. Uh, and when we get in the next verses, it kind of starts touching upon that, the fact that, I don't know, sometimes we're not sure we are the beloved. But, but anyway, we'll get to that in a moment. And that's where um, you do hear throughout Paul's epistles is this understanding that we are the fragrance of Christ and offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So there's that dynamic of the word of God is that fragrancy in a world that doesn't smell really good. I mean, you think about all the <laughs> the, the realities like you're mentioning, the brokenness and and um, and I'll just I'll just say this, too, because it's deep on my heart. My first parish was 10 minutes from Waukesha, Wisconsin. And so I know exactly those roads. I've drank at those coffee shops. I, you know, if, if we still were in Wisconsin, we might have been at that parade that happened. And there's this kind of this smell of brokenness that's there. And, and, and that's where the Lord calls us. One, the word of God is that fragrance of the forgiveness and grace and reminding us that he's with us even in the brokenness. At the same time that we are called to be fragrant in our own lives that people may know Christ and to, to find peace on this side of eternity, all in the name of Jesus, of course. So that is, I, I, that's why I really appreciate you bringing that up is not only the word, but also our lives as well. So, so Brady, man, you really got my mind running and what, what a great, great insight. So, so you got, I'm stinky. I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although I did take a shower. <laughs> Not that it matters. We're we're doing this from what six hundred miles apart. But That's but right. so so how do you you take a stinky thing and how do you make it smell better? Well, you put you put the perfume on it. You put the fragrance on it, and then all of a sudden the stinky thing isn't stinky anymore. Now, it didn't come from itself. It didn't make itself not to be stinky. But because you put the fragrance on it, now it is fragrant. Now it is appealing. And, and, and what a beautiful picture of how it works, right? We will always be stinky. I'm sorry. There's nothing you can do that will change the stinkiness of our sinfulness. But Christ has changed it completely, hasn't it? Because he's anointed us with his fragrance, with his beauty, with his aroma that just draws us to him. Oh, man, Thanksgiving, I'm thinking of that turkey. And don't you want to be there when that turkey is taken out of the oven and the fresh rolls and all of that? Mm -hmm. and, and, and thank you for that powerful insight, Brady, because that's what we need to remember now. Now we're the fragrance in the world. 
not in and mm-hmm. of ourselves, but because of what Christ has given us in his love and forgiveness. And we just need to let everyone else smell that. And when they say, they say, man, you smell good. So it's not me. It's the love. <laughs> it's the forgiveness we have in Christ. That's, that's the, the, omer, the aroma that you're smelling. Well, let's continue on as the Shulamite woman speaks again. But it's, it's a transition. It goes from basically the marriage union to as what the commentaries were saying is to like the period of courtship that she speaks about herself and the relationship that they are about to have. So verses five through seven, the Shulamite says, I am very dark, but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom your soul, my soul loves, where your pasture, your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? So now she starts speaking about herself and how, how does she describe herself, her history, um, how she sees herself in many ways. So what, what, do, you, what do you have? All right, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling Luther here, and, and, and I don't know that everybody would agree with this interpretation, but, but it, it seems to work for me. Luther thinks the, the darkness here is, is the sinfulness, is the failing, is mm-hmm. the, the weakness, mm-hmm. is the tribulation, it is the doubt. Uh, and, and Luther contends that the tents of Kedar were, were Arabian tents that were rather ugly and plain, and the contrast then is with the curtains of Solomon, which, of course, we know Solomon stuff is going to be beautiful and great and, and, and regal. And, and that's the tension. You know, uh, we look at ourselves and all we can see is this, this darkness, but, but yet we know we're lovely. Because our lover has told us that we're lovely, you know, and so we look at the tents of Kedar and we see nothing but plain and 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 uh, 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 simpleness, and yet somehow we look at what we're dressed up with, the clothing, right? Be dressed in Christ, we put on Christ, and and that's lovely, and, and so that's what she means. She says, "Do not gaze at me because I'm dark. Don't look at that side of me." Don't don't look at that. That the sun, you know, has, and 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 Luther sees here the sun uh, that has looked upon me. He sees that as the wrath of God. Now I don't know if that's where I would have gone with it because you think a sun, you think of Jesus. I would have mm-hmm. thought of the fact that even though we are dark and sinful, that Jesus still is there. He's still shining on us. But but anyway, Luther's take was, yeah, that's me. I, I'm I'm dark. Uh, you know, the wrath of God has come upon me, uh, and certainly my mother's sons were angry with me. See, that's that's not a very pretty image. Uh, um, and, and in fact, I, I didn't understand this business about they made me a keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Uh, and I think maybe the, the English translation confuses that because it makes it sound like you got two vineyards, right? You, you've mm-hmm. got the vineyard that you were the keeper and then you got your own vineyard. Whereas Luther sees that, and I think it makes more sense that this is the same vineyard. Uh, that's the point. I was given a vineyard and man, I just haven't done what I need to do. Uh, and, of course, Luther is taking this from a political standpoint, and he sees it as Solomon saying, you know, God gave me this kingdom, and I look at it over now, and I don't know. If, I don't know if I did. I, maybe I didn't do a very good job. It seems like we just got all kinds of problems and all kinds of trials, all kinds of things have gone wrong. Uh, and so if you take that interpretation, that the darkness and, and, and the sun's being angry and I have not kept my vineyard, it, it's kind of a confession that things are not working out the way you'd think they would for the beloved of the Lord. Uh, then this verse 7 becomes a prayer. So tell me, you who my soul loves. See, I know that. I cannot see it in my life, but I know it because you've told me that you love me. So, so where, where, where are you going to pasture your flock? Where are you going to make it lie down at noon? Where do I go from here, kind of? Uh, for why should I be like one who veils herself? Veiling, of course, is always a symbol of sorrow, of mourning. Uh, why, so, so don't allow me to stay here in my mourning and my sorrow, but, but show me where my place is amongst the flocks of your companions. So that's Luther's interpretation, that now we are the Christian who is struggling with whatever it might be, illness, family problems, unemployment, I don't know. There's so many things that we can struggle with. And, and the prayer is, now, now show me, Lord. Show, show me your love. Show me what I need to do. You know, show me the track that I need to follow. Oh, and I'm jumping the gun, isn't it? That's in the next verse. Mm-hmm. So. 
that you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're go moving along. Yeah. It is interesting to me as, as you read Luther, because in the, the commentary, it was a more of like a, a practical re like reading this as a, a real story in the sense yeah. of that she grew up on a vineyard and the mother's sons were angry because she didn't keep it up very well. And she's dark because she worked in the fields for so long. So maybe she didn't consider herself to be beautiful. And so she definitely had her failures. And so she's pleading with him, uh, Solomon to still love her. Um, and to, uh, like you said, kind of that prayer in verse seven to, that, 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 that he would love her despite her loneliness. Now, with that would be this, obviously, this, this understanding of darkness, of sin, um, the failures we have. And when we plead with the Lord for mercy, guess what? He gives it. And so I think there's a connection there. It's interesting how Luther takes some of these things, because you're not always quite sure how we are to, to put that all together. But Dr. Mitchell definitely looked at this as, that she came from a lowly estate, from a vineyard that was not kept up. She has many failures, and she pleads with the husband, Solomon, to have mercy upon her. And the same thing for us. We are lowly in state. We are dark in sin, and therefore our only prayer, our only hope is that he will draw us um, draw us to him is, is the goal. That's what, what I had found. And, and, you know, it's interesting uh, um, that, that so you've got Luther and Dr. Mitchell— I, interpret it in a little bit different way and yet mm -hmm. really saying essentially the same thing uh, right. as a christian we, we constantly confront the fact that well yeah we've not kept our vineyard uh, you know i was a pastor for 40 years and, and and i would have to admit there were things that i wish i could have done differently that i should have done differently uh, as a pastor in those 40 years i, I think we reflect on our lives and we do that we just see that uh, what God has given us to take care of, we really, really haven't taken care of it, and 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 we do. We get out there, and we're in, in the heat of the sun, you know. In fact, that's what the uh, they, they remember how they they com they complain about that. You know, we worked out in the heat of the sun, and you're giving these guys that came in at the last minute the same pay that we got, you know. And so there is mm -hmm. that kind of thought that we've worked hard, and 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 and, and we do. I, I I love that analogy by by uh, Dr. Mitchell that we just don't feel like how can anyone love us? How can mm -hmm. anyone love us? But, but see, isn't that the beauty of faith? What do we do in the face of those doubts? We turn back to our beloved and say, please, please show us that you, you still love us. You know, we can't do that. We've tried. We really wanted to trust in you, but we just can't do it. But you can. We know you can. And then, of course, we get the beautiful. And see, that fits perfectly, the, the picture that Mitchell gives us. Because in the next verses, then we have our beloved talk to us, don't we? And our yeah. beloved assures us, even though we're dark, even though we didn't keep the vineyard up the way we should, even though our mother's sons are angry at us, guess what? We are still his beloved child. Don't ever, ever, well, we do doubt it. But know that that's never true, that, that uh, he doesn't love us, yeah. And this is where I, I did read a little bit on the part where it says, uh, for why should I be like the one who veils herself beside the flock of your companions? And there she very, very much so speaking about to veil would mean that you are basically a prostitute. And so oh, she's yeah. definitely getting to this point where she sees herself as just at the lowest of lows. I mean, she's realizing the depth of her she doesn't deserve to be with the king. She's reflecting on her life. This goes to Tamar in Genesis 38 and so forth. And, and she's definitely seeing this as the only way this works is by grace. And I think that's a perfect connection for us as Christ's love for the church. And we realize, as we should, that the only thing this is, the only way this is going to work is by the grace of God. Because, well, nothing to the um, nothing do I bring to the table, but only Christ himself. So um, anything and, else before we move on? Is that a great comfort to know that in the very moment when we are despairing, in the very moment when maybe we feel like crying out, my God, my God, why has that yeah. forsaken me? It is the very moment when you should know you're not forsaken. In fact, you actually have a God who understands exactly what you're going through and what you're feeling. And I tell you what, this is why I'm drawn to Jesus, because I've checked out the other gods, Brady, and there isn't a God like that anywhere else to be found. There is no other God who can come and say, I know exactly the despair and the doubt and the depression you're feeling. And let me tell you this, I will never, ever abandon you, as we'll see now in these next verses. 8 through 10, we hear from Solomon. If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, 
follow in the tracks of the flock and pastures of our young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. So I think if any questions about Solomon's love for the Shulamite, I think it gets completely, um, we know for sure in verse 8, how does he see her and what is he saying? And, 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 and Luther has just really three very simple practical things from a text that is supposed to make us complete in, in uh, the works of God. Number one, you need to remember you are the most beautiful among women in the eyes of God. That's just what we are. I'm sorry. You may not see it. You may think that you're dark and ugly and whatever, but no, you are the most beautiful amongst uh, women in the eyes of God. Uh, following the tracks of the flock, Luther says, hey, this is nothing new. The things that you're struggling with, they've been experienced for Christians throughout the ages. There's The stories of these struggles and trials are, are, are filled in the Old and New Testament. So just go back to the tracks of the flock. Go back to the things you've seen that's happened to Christians before and how over and over again, like you said, uh, they went down to the tomb in despair because their, their Savior was dead. They knew it. It was over and done with. And of course, they left uh, jumping and leaping for joy. Uh, and then finally, I, I thought this was cool. Pasture your own goats beside the shepherd's tent. You can, you can sit and bemoan about how you failed to take care of the flock and the vineyard. And you know what you need to do is just do whatever God has given you to do. Okay, mm. quit, quit bemoaning these things. Know you are the most beautiful. Think of the, 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 the tracks of the people that have come before you and just do whatever it is the Lord has given you to do. Uh, and don't worry about it if it's not just exactly the way you thought it should be. So I thought those were some good, good words of advice. Uh, because again, as you said, we, we're the beloved of the Lord. We, we are the mayor amongst Pharaoh's chariots. We, we, our cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. No, we are this, this one that God loves and cherishes. And this is where um, Ephesians 5 comes in. Although from lowly estate, he dresses her up as a bride without blemish. And I thought that was a great, that whole understanding of ornaments and jewels is it doesn't say, well, there's no sin there. But on account of Christ, that is how the Lord sees us. And for her, it's the same thing, that he really can't see anything else but this lovely ornament. He sees her as a mare among Pharaoh's chariots, that she's the most beautiful of beautiful. And, and, and in a little sense, this makes me realize how much we, should, we as husbands should speak of our wives in that same way. Like, I think as husbands, we all need to work on that. We need to be able to uplift our wives for what the Lord has given us in Christ. And the same way, it shows us the Lord who sees us in Christ with all blemish on account of what Jesus has done for us. Last thoughts before I, we move on. Well, I just really like that analogy you used about the ornamentation. The ornamentation mm -hmm. is what brings the beauty. It's what's put on us. It's what's outside of us. Uh, ah, Luther yeah. makes a really good point about the ornaments of gold studded with silver. The fact that it, it's going to get better. It's going to get better than you ever thought, this gold and silver. So no matter what you might be uh, struggling with now, trust me, the Lord's got gold and silver he's going to ornament you with. You know, as Jesus says, whatever you've lost here, you're going to get back a hundredfold. So I thought that was kind of a neat thought for Luther, too, that the gold and silver mm. just shows us how much better it's going to be. You know, ah, you know? yeah. How can it, how can it not then point <laughs> us to, to, uh, to heaven? I mean, the new yeah. heaven, new earth. I mean, this is... This is beautiful, that wonderful connection that we have there, because we just studied what will heaven be like on Sunday, which always brings a unique perspective from all of us, including myself. And But there you have all this vision of the new Jerusalem and the, 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 the different uh, metals, the perfection that will be there. And here we get kind of a, a glimpse uh, of that yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, we get a glimpse yeah. of it. Wow, that's good stuff. Wow. Anyways, so I'll read 11 through 14. 11 through 14. We have about eight minutes left in our time. Okay. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver, as you mentioned. Then she says, while the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a, a sachet of myrrh and lies between my breasts. And beloved, it is a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. So th there's a lot of things here that we just will not understand. I haven't been to the venues of Engedi. I haven't had a henna blossom <laughs> anytime recently. But definitely you have that 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 smell that is that is good. Like the smell that you want to have in your life. And that's what is there and she's bringing up these these smells and I'll say this that there is something about when you smell something that it brings back memories. 
And here it clearly is bringing memories of when I see my wife and I'm with my wife, these are the smells I have. When I see my husband, I'm with my husband. These are the smells that bring joy to me because of, because I am in his presence. And how can we not also see God in this as well? What are your thoughts? Well, so Luther uh, translates that first verse this way. He says, the king is still on his couch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the ESV says while the king, but but uh, I think Luther must interpret whatever Hebrew word is as translated while he translates that still, and, and of course the point he's making is so so we had this period where you know we were getting criticized by the people outside us right the mother's sons and and we ourselves looked and we saw well we really didn't tend to the vineyard the way we should no wonder people are criticizing mm. us and we're kind of dark and maybe we're not as and and, and uh, so Luther's understanding is look. Look, yeah, I know you've got struggles. I know you've got questions. I know you've got doubts. But the fact is, the king is still on the couch. <laughs> okay? Right, right. Uh, and, and what's really cool is he hasn't left us. The, the, the beloved is still there right at our breast, right? The fragrance is still there with us. Just listen to the Word of God. See, that's the problem. You don't listen to the Word of God. You're going to have all kinds of reasons to doubt whether you're the beloved. But you listen to the Word of God, and, and oh, no, yep, that's it. He's still there. He's still in control. Uh, it may seem like he isn't, but he is. He is. So I thought that was kind of a neat interpretation. The king is still on the couch. The one who loves us, who's drawing us into his chamber. Remember, that's how we started. He's drawing us into his chamber. He's still there. He's still doing the drawing. He's still going to bring us close to him, as we'll see in the, the closing verses. And here's something that I discovered on my own, and I don't know whether it means anything or not, that the henna blossoms there, the henna blossoms. Now, we know it's got to be some kind of plant, right? Because right. it's in the vineyards of En Gedi. Uh, but honest to God, nobody knows what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. right. they're, 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 yeah, we don't know what they are. But what I thought was strange is that the, the, the vocables there, or maybe they're not the vocals, the consonants there, the Hebrew consonants, I think is the word I'm looking for. Those words that are translated Hannah Blossom are the same consonants that go for the Hebrew word ransom or atonement. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the same, the same mm -hmm. word. Now, maybe I'm making too big of a point, but it does seem strange to me that Solomon chooses the word ransom, the word atonement, the word of propitiation, this great word of God's salvation uh, from the Old Testament, that he uses that here uh, in this henna blossom in the vineyard, whatever it is. So I, I can't think that was a, a fluke or an accident. I, I have to think that Solomon was reminding us, here's how you know, <laughs> okay? Because your redemption has drawn nigh. Jesus has died for you. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing that could happen in the world that would change the greatest act of love that any man does for his beloved, which is to lay down his life. So anyway. And how can we not also think about how sweet the name of Jesus sounds when you hear that? Ah, um, because exactly. Jesus' name is about atonement, and that, and that brings us to that sweet name that not only is sweet tasting or something, you know, it brings you to the Lord's Supper, but also the smell reminds us of his love for us. So, Pastor, I'm going to finish the rest of our verses, and we have about three minutes left of our time. So he and then she speaks, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful, your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. So it's a back and forth. They both consider themselves to be beautiful to each other. You are beautiful, my beloved, my love. Um, language that I think if you were around it, you'd be like, okay, that's enough. Just, it's just, just tone it down a little bit here, folks. Get, get a room. But get a room. Get a room. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. So um, <laughs> that is what they're doing. It's a feel here. It's a, it's a feel. But it definitely just brings out the deep love they have and obviously points us to Christ as well. What do you have for the last uh, he, she um, commentary here? Well, what's it say? We love because he first loved us, right? Ah, yes. And, and that's the thing. It, it, he's the initiator. And we're the ones that have expressed the doubt, right? We're the ones that said, oh, man, we're so dark and we haven't kept our vineyard. And he just comes and says, 
behold, you're beautiful, my love. Okay? Behold, you're beautiful. Your eyes are doves. He just says to us again, look, you, you are the one I love. You're the one I care for. Don't, don't look at these other things. No, no, just remember, hear me. I love you. And then, of course, what is the response? Well, you're beautiful, too. You are my beloved. You're truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of your house are cedar. Our rafters are pine. And, of course, I, I couldn't help but think of David in Psalm 23. Surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, he's drawn me into his uh, abode, and, and we're going to be here. And, and, and again, Jesus promised, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So it's just such a beautiful, beautiful conclusion to this chapter. Whatever doubts we might have right now about God's love for us, just listen to this word he's spoken to you in, in the eyes of the Lord because of his forgiveness because of his atonement his ransom we we are beautiful and we can't be more see there is that sin in, in us that says oh we got to do something more to make God love us and I'm telling you right now you don't need to do anything more God does love you and and as we believe that and we will be beautiful, and we will be loving, and, and we'll love God even more as well. Um, so anyway, that's the, that's my thoughts. Can, can I as share we with at, you? Do we have, we have 30 sorry, seconds. Do we have time for give us, give Okay, us well, then I want— there's a, Luther's got a quote, too, about uh, Solomon thinking how terrible things were, but, but now he knows— no, no, no. I've got something that will not crumble. I've got a bed bedecked with flowers. I've got this house of cedar and the rafters yeah. of pine. Uh, as it says in Psalm 36, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Okay, yeah. So as we look at that, um, well, it's about God's love, as you said. We love because he first loved us. Pastor John Lekomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, giving us God's strong word from Song of Songs, Chapter 1. Pastor Lekomsky, thank you again for the gifts. It's a joy, Brady. It's always a joy. <laughs> the saints of our Lord, the Shulamite woman, was from a lowly background. King Solomon brought her to himself as his bride. We, the church, are lowly in sin, but by love and grace, our King of Kings has brought us to himself by his blood. That is the filter by which we read this blessed book, and may it be the filter of everything we do in our lives. For we love, for he first loved us. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand.